properties of the virus which is temporary because it's not genetically controlled, uh, but which have some importance in various aspects of virology. Um, one is something called complementation. Uh, and this is when you get an interaction at the functional level. So viruses exchange proteins rather than nucleic acids. Uh, and so how does this work? Uh, well, here we've got a model pink virus, which looks like it's a rhabdovirus. And so here, this one has temperature sensitive. Remember I said about temperature sensitivity. So it's got an end protein, which at higher temperatures uh, apparently will fall apart and not function. But it's N for nucleic acid. Its maturation protein is wild type. So that's perfectly good. It's just got a mutation in its nucleic acid protein. Here we're taking the blue mutant, mutant 2, uh, which has got a perfectly good nucleic acid protein that has got a mutation in its maturation protein. So neither of these viruses can grow alone in the cell at the higher temperature, say 37 degrees, uh, because this one's um, nucleic capsid protein will fall apart and this one's maturation protein will fall apart. But if you put them both into the same cell, then this can provide good maturation protein, this can provide good nucleic capsid protein, and you'll get new virus particles assembled using the good proteins from each virus particle. And so what you'll get is output virus, but it will, so it will be assembled using blue nucleic capsid protein and purple maturation protein, but the genomes will still be temperature sensitive. So temporarily, two viruses which couldn't grow can complement each other by providing the missing function. Uh, but it's just a temporary thing. The output virus reads true to the original genomes. So this is called complementation. No genetic change is involved, but a temporary change in the virus particle. And just an out, a consequence of that is usually uh, uh, two mutants in the same gene don't complement each other. They can't provide the missing function. So usually uh, the mutants that complement each other are in separate genes. Okay. So another aspect of these, um, this ability of viruses to complement is seen in defective viruses. Um, defective viruses are viruses which lack a gene or genes which are necessary for their completion of their infectious cycle. Uh, and what they, so how do you grow these things or how do they grow? And what they need is a helper virus to provide the missing function. So the, the helper virus, it's a one-way complementation thing. Uh, the helper virus is providing the proteins that these can't code for. So they can only grow in the presence of a virus which is going to give them the missing function. And when you come to look at these, um, they can actually be incredibly defective because really, in order to get their genome copied, if the, virus, the missing virus is going to provide everything that you need, that the virus needs for replication and packaging, um, what they need is some kind of signal on the genome that says copy me so that you make new copies of the defective virus and some kind of signal on the genome that says package me so that that gets incorporated into new virus particles. Uh, but potentially, all the other genes uh, could be deleted uh, and or the other genetic coding regions could be deleted and those functions provided uh, by the help of virus because those are all things that can diffuse around the cell. The only things that actually have to be attached to the genome, a part of the genome, have to be these, copy me and package me. So you can get a really tiny little virus particle and that's all it has. Um, some of the defective particles may just lose one gene or so. So where do we see examples of these defective viruses? Um, you'll be hearing from Dr. Richard Hunt about some of the retroviruses um, which have picked up um, host cell genes um, and have lost their own genes at the same time. Um, and they use a related helper virus that, which provides the missing functions. And you'll be hearing from Dr. Duffus next week about hepatitis virus and he viruses. And hepatitis delta virus is a defective virus. I've already talked about that in the introductory lectures. Uh, it's questionable as to whether it's even a really a true virus. Uh, but it uses an unrelated helper virus, which in this case is hepatitis B virus, um, to provide the envelope for it so that it can actually get itself packaged. So it's a parasite on an unrelated virus 
uh, some of these retroviruses are parasites on related viruses. So what this means is these viruses can actually not grow unless there's a, a something to provide the missing function. Now, there's a subclass of these defective viruses which are known as defective interfering viruses or particles because um, since they can't code for their own thing, are they true viruses? We get into semantics. So I'm not going to go into that further, but it does explain why some books use different terminology. And these defective interfering particles, why, why do we call about interference? Um, they tend to decrease the replication of the helper virus. And this seems to be largely because the helper virus is providing everything for itself and for the defective viruses. They tend to be smaller than the, help, the wild type anyway. They replicate more rapidly. Um, so they tend to uh, deplete the viral pool. And if the helper virus is not making enough of an excess of these viral precursors, it actually damages the replication of the helper virus. Um, so defective interfering particles may actually um, decrease the rate of replication of the wild type virus, and they can modulate wild type infections. Uh, and we know examples of this in animals at least. Uh, and as I say, these defective interfering particles occur naturally. Uh, and one example of a defective interfering particle that we do know of in human disease is a rare complication of measles. And I'll be talking about this again on Friday, uh, probably if we change the lecture schedule. Um, in measles virus, what you find is you, there's a disease called subacute sclerosing panencephalitis, um, or SSPE. Uh, and that is a consequence of a defective interfering uh, virus particle um, that hangs out in the brain, that grows very slowly, uh, and eventually, years after the initial infection, um, can cause this sclerosing panencephalitis. Uh, and these are not competent viruses. They don't shed measles virus. Um, they, uh, they are lacking, in many cases, they're lacking the maturation protein. Uh, and they're often lacking, lacking other proteins. So they don't produce new virus particles, uh, but they gradually um, replicate very slowly in the brain and cause this disease. We'll go into that in more detail. So these defective interfering particles are genetic mut mutants. They've got altered genomes, but they only survive uh, because they can get complementation or, or one-way complementation from their helper viruses. Okay, any questions? Okay, so then we come to another aspect of viruses, um, uh, how they can change their outer appearance, um, but still no genetic changes. And this is something called phenotypic mixing. Uh, if you have two viruses, we've got here a purple and a green virus, um, if they both grow in the same cell, then it's possible that when they're assembled, there is a kind of complementation, but then neither of these was damaged. They could grow perfectly well on their own, but they can potentially exchange the proteins, and we're particularly concerned here about the proteins in the virus surface. So this can be an envelope virus or a nuclear capsid, uh, or a, a naked virus. Uh, and they can, then what you find is that nuclear capsid can have the attachment proteins and the other proteins that should be on the outer surface of the other virus. Or if it's an envelope, it will be the glycoproteins that will be in the envelope of the other virus. So what you get are these mixed outer surfaces. As I say, this can be nuclear capsid or envelope, according to whether you're naked or, or uh, enveloped. So this virus will not be completely neutralized by antibody to the green virus, um, because it's got purple virus attachment proteins in it. And similarly with this one, it won't be entirely neutralized by antibody to this one because it's got green uh, attachment proteins in it. So these two viruses will, to neut get neutralizing antibody against a virus like this, you actually need antibody to both of these viruses. So temporarily, they will behave as if they've got the attachment properties of the other virus as well as the attachment properties of themselves. And so this is said to be phenotypic mixing. They've got a change in their phenotype. They will now infect cells that are infected by the green virus and the purple virus. Uh, and as I say, their antibodies that neutralize them, will be, you'll need to have both in order to neutralize these creatures. But inside the genome is 
the same as it always was. So when they infect a cell, the outcome of it will be true purple virus or true green virus. So again, a temporary change. So there are no changes in the genome. It will possibly alter the host range and it will possibly, uh, and it will change the antibody neutralization story. And you can actually, by playing tricks in the lab, largely, um, get a completely changed virus. So you can actually sometimes get the extreme end of that, where here the purple virus is packaged entirely in a green coat, as I say, either uh, a capsid if it's naked or the envelope if it's enveloped. And here you can get the green entirely in purple. And so here, this virus, as far as its host range and, nuclear and uh, antibody neutralization go, behave entirely as if it was purple. Uh, and this one will behave entirely as if it's green, even though they've got the opposite genome inside them. So they are, can be a sheep in wolf's clothing or a wolf in sheep's clothing. Uh, but what this means is this virus temporarily behaves as if it's very different. And so it's said to be a pseudotype because effectively it behaves from the outside, it looks like it's a completely different virus. And so you get phenotypic mixing. Phenotypic mixing um, is you see in both naked and enveloped viruses. Pseudotypes um, can be more difficult to get. Um, and one thing is that, sorry, let me just go back to the phenotypic mixing. In phenotypic mixing, these nuclear capsids can come from the same family or from different families. Um, but, and they can be, as I say, enveloped or non-enveloped. But for pseudotypes, what you tend to see is that the enveloped viruses are much better at packaging foreign nuclear capsids than are the non-enveloped viruses. So for the non-enveloped viruses, uh, you don't tend to see pseudotypes so much. Um, between, oh, wait a minute, I'm getting you confused. Let me just go back a second. These two genomes can be from the same family or very different families. If you've got a non-enveloped virus, they tend to be from the same family for this. If you've got an, um, an enveloped virus, then enveloped viruses seem to be quite good at packaging nuclear capsids from different families. So one example of that, for example, is you can get a retrovirus nuclear capsid inside a rhabdovirus envelope. And so you can make something which is retrovirus inside, but it's got the host range of a rhabdovirus. And actually, that is being used as a basis for some genetic transfers as well. So what they do is they put the vesicular stomatitis virus uh, on the outside, so it, it behaves from the point of antibodies and host ranges, vesicular stomatitis virus. But inside, it's got a retrovirus, so it's got a very different family of viruses. You can't tend to get that kind of cross-family thing with the non-enveloped ones. Okay. Any questions? Sorry. Okay. So, and those pseudotypes, of course, once they go into the cells, they breed true. 